Okay, my name is Jim Bretman, Jim Myers and Sons, here to um, spend about 30 minutes on addressing key equipment for the separation process. That's both scum, grit, and screening separation. I'm going to be focusing on key application and design considerations with on the equipment that you're seeing on your screen. I'm going to be going through quite a few slides. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, and I'm not going to be reading the bullets. I'm going to let you do that. I'm going to be focusing more on application and design considerations, and uh, we'll be scooting, scooting along, uh, respecting your time and trying to make sure we knock this out in 30 minutes. So uh, I welcome. We've got engineers uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast, California as well. We're, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. JMS is. I'm going to start with the scum pipes, uh, and we're talking about skimming, separation being the skimming of floating solids, if you will, floating scum. Uh, the most common skimmer used is the rotating scum pipe system. It is its application. It's the most, it's typically used in a batch or intermittent use, not typically a continuous operation. You can see the materials of construction here and the diameters. If you will, on the drawing to the left, the fundamental aspect or design consideration for a scum pipe system is the flow needs to flow towards the pipe. Obviously, it's a very slow rate, but it, in this rendering you see on the right, the flow is flowing from 5 o'clock to 11 o'clock, if you will. And that's necessary for the scum pipe to perform as intended. There are various operations, methods of operation for the scum pipe. It's uh, design considerations or how often are you needing, are they wanting to rotate it? How, how often is plant personnel needing to rotate and dip the pipe, if you will? You see in the lower left picture is a lever operated. Obviously, if you're having to dip too often throughout the day or the week, you, you're, a lever operation is very manual and all the pros and cons that go with manual. When you want, need to rotate it, but not as often as needing to electric actuate it and automate it from a SCADA system, as you can see in the middle pictures, top and bottom middle pictures, they have electric actuators that can be tied to SCADA. The other option is on your right, bottom right, is a hand wheel. Um, so a hand wheel is just easier to use, easier access, what have you, versus the lever operation. So fundamentally, those are the three types of um, operators that you can use. Uh, of course, an electric actuator has a manual hand wheel backup as well so that you, you know, have a fallback. Key design considerations for the end bearing assemblies are that they need to be adjustable. Um, that's key because over time, worm gears, looking over to your right there, the worm gears engaging with the rack, which, sorry, the pipe and the rack are not shown in this rendering, otherwise it would uh, be difficult to get a, a visual of, of the seals we're showing you here. But the worm gear, the worm engaging with the rack on a pipe um, when, when that's the operating system is key for it to be adjustable in all directions, X, Y, and Z axes is important for the seals to be able to be adjustable with a follower angle ring to be able to adjust and tighten the, 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 the seals um, over time is important. So those are the key design considerations when evaluating a scum pipe system. Project Spotlights, Boston, Massachusetts, Deer Island. This is the largest uh, project actually Jim Myers and Sons has had, had to date, $7.5 million project. And all those primary and secondary basins right there have, have our scum pipes, over 500 tons of scum pipes. And I guess the moral to this story is that uh, Boston Deer Island had serious problems for years, uh, decades apparently, with their scum pipe systems. They were very sensitive about what they were going to do, scope of supply-wise or scope-wise, as well as who was going to do it. And we were fortunate enough to work with them for about a year and a half on this project, developing the specs, and then fortunate enough to get the job. So as far as the scum pipes, I, yeah, we're, we're, we feel like we're the industry leader, but importantly, we've got thousands of scum pipes in operation. For the engineers that are online here, um, we've got lots of experience and can help you with the design. And importantly, 
once we get a handle on the diameter of the scum pipes uh, that apply to your project and the approximate length, there's a very good chance that we've got a CAD drawing that's going to be the same diameter and darn close to the length that you need uh, that we can provide you to assist you in your um, design and spec development. Rolling into, still sticking with um, scum removal, floating scum removal, Delta skimmers, these are, these are, skimmers are the other method for surface skimming scum, and the, the, where they apply is they are more, and there's both a helical and a paddle wheel type skimmer system, they're more continuous operating systems. They, that's what they're designed for. And again, here's a helical in the upper left, and then you've got a paddle wheel, and just a straight arm, if you will, paddle wheel skimmer system. Essentially, they function the same way. So the difference between these systems and a scum pipe is, again, these are typically continuous operation, 360-degree rotation, They're typically a chain and sprocket drive. And the difference, the, the, the design considerations um, uh, and the application of a helical versus a paddle wheel skimmer is a paddle wheel skimmer with the straight arms, and then there's a beach underneath. I'll have a picture here. You can kind of see a beach underneath the helical skimmer there. Paddle wheel skimmers are often used for DAF applications where the scum is a little more crusty or, or solid, if you will. So that these paddles dig into the scum, pull it up the beach, and kind of pull the surface scum towards the paddle. Um, and that's where their application is most often. Helical skimmers, on the other hand, because of their configuration, as they're pulling the scum up the beach, because of the helical feature, the free water tends to float back down into the basin. The paddle wheel skimmer is going to grab anything it grabs, water and scum, and dump it into the trough. So that's the, two, that's the difference between the helical and paddle wheel application and then the difference in the application between just these type skimmers versus scum pipes. Uh, it, Croton Water, uh, Croton, New York, underneath this golf course is a wastewater treatment plant um, where it was a 2007 project where we provided 48 of those paddle wheel, you can see them in the bottom picture, of the paddle wheel type design where we worked for, with uh, Hazen and Sawyer there. Again, I think the key where we can help you the most is help you determine which type skimming system for your application, and there's a good likelihood we've got a CAD drawing um, that can help you uh, in your efforts in, in the spec, spec development. The next product I'll get into in the next uh, application is grit separation. And the, de the Delta classifier, a grit classifier is, you know, obviously a fundamental piece of equipment that's employed for grit removal. The, it removes, it separates grit from water and the purpose of it is to, to help extend the life and the performance of the pumps, uh, of the valves, etc., downstream from the classifier. Uh, it is a very, it's an abrasive application, more so than a corros corrosive application. Grit classifiers, the one you see in the top here, uh, is it has no hydrocyclone. These classifiers typically are 300 gallons, 250 gallons a minute or less, um, typically, uh, in size. They can accommodate a higher flow, but if they do, the hopper and the whole system starts to get bigger and bigger. And as the hopper gets bigger, the screw ne needs to get longer. So you play into all of that, and typically after 300 gallons a minute or so, Hydrocyclones are employed, and with hydrocyclones, um, if you have a thousand gallons a minute flowing into a hydrocyclone, only six to ten percent of that, so only a hundred gallons of a thousand gallons is going down into the classifier. The other ninety percent, or nine hundred gallons, is going back into the process. So that's the advantage of a hydrocyclone is when the flows start to get high. Grid classifiers can certainly be located, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but can be located in our incline screws um, in concrete basins, where essentially the floor, the design of the basin is such that the grit 
flows down through an inclined floor, what have you, to the bottom of the screw. And this screw conveyor is turning very slowly, slow RPM. So that is, as the grit clears the water level, uh, the free water tends to fall, it fall, does fall back into the basin, and the grit comes out the top at the end. Shafted or shaftless uh, grit classifiers. There's pros and cons to both. Historically, mostly, because it's such an abrasive application, they've typically been shafted screws. And they're short enough that they don't have an intermediate hanger bearing um, uh, associated with them. So it's a shafted screw conveyor supported on each end, typically. Uh, shaftless screw conveyors can certainly be employed. It's kind of a nice thought to not, not have an end bearing down at the bottom where you're collecting grit. The, the downside to that is just the nature of shaftless conveyors is something has to sacrifice. Shaftless conveyors are cantilever conveyors. They rest on a, a, a liner. Um, either the liner is softer than the screw spiral or the other way around, but one of the two have to be sacrificial. So this is a very abrasive application. That's why typically shafted conveyors have been employed. We promote an external end bearing assembly, different than a, several of our competitors. I, don't, I won't mention anybody. And, we believe we, we like to get the end bearing outside of the grid. Why have an internal lower end bearing assembly in exactly the area we're trying to collect all the grit? Um, that's why we promote and uh, support as, as our standard an external uh, end bearing assembly. It's very visible, easy to see, easy to repair, low cost to repair as well. So that's our reasons we head that direction with the external. Just interestingly, we provided a couple of uh, grid classifiers to one plant uh, engineer. Was so happy, uh, uh, pleased with the results that they automatically, or I say, just without much input from us, just uh, have specified us at other plants as well. Um, further to grit removal, from uh, grit removal separation, is uh, the airlift pump system been around since the beginning of time, I think. A very simple process, airlift pumps. Uh, you can see kind of a depiction rendering here on the right side here where the floor of the basin is, in, is sloped such that grit accumulates. Slide, this is a better view of it. Grit collects in the bottom. You're not seeing everything here, but a pump, a blower rather. So high volume air, not high pressure, but high volume air from a blower air is injected at about this, about this level um, near the bottom uh, into the adductor an airlift pump and as the air is wanting to rise the grid is rising with it and the grid is coming out and coming out the pipe um, the discharge here so it, they can be used for grit or sludge removal applications but most often we see them for grit uh, you know they're not in a high demand it's kind of you have to have the right basin uh, right application but then again uh, some places like here, uh, Stickney, Illinois, uh, 24 airlift pumps um, were employed. Uh, interesting story there is th that uh, when we first started dealing with the engineer, uh, really and Hanson, they, they uh, didn't want to really communicate with as much because they had heard that at a plant just north of them at Calumet, there's a large wastewater treatment plant and the airlift pumps weren't working well at all. So they weren't happy, so we jumped all over that. We want to know when our equipment's not working. So we jumped on that. It was a 2009 project and found out that it wasn't our airlift pumps that were working. Ours were working very well. But, but the point is, is that, um, that that flipped the whole thing. The perception that their, our airlifts weren't working well, then they find out they were, and we ended up getting a pretty large job that we're, that we're pleased to get. And another reason was full-scale testing was, was necessary, um, was specified on this project. So these are 30 foot, fall t uh, 30 foot tall tanks that we constructed and built a test, um, a full scale test that they came down and inspected and we're pleased with the results. So we're fully capable of doing those kinds of things and um, ensuring the application will work as intended. Uh, again, we've got pump curves available, um, drawings, uh, et cetera. I uh, wanted to share with you here, here's an airlift pump discharging to a grid classifier that we talked about earlier. Um, so the, the slurry of grit and water goes to a grit classifier and further separates the grit. 
last product I'll touch base with you on is a delta compactor. Now we're talking about separation and compaction of screening. The compactors, washer compactors, they not only dewater, but they remove organics as well as compact, as well as convey. You can see in this picture there's a couple of screens where there's a shaftless screw conveyor receiving the material, discharging to a compactor and to a dumpster. Um, part of a key design consideration, the application is, do you want to convey raw screenings to a compactor versus you can, and let me see here, we're receiving um, the compactor is directly below the screen, and you can see it's, so it's receiving direct, and then convey from there. Typically, conveying compacted screenings any kind of distance um, is not desirable, but there are always exceptions, as we all know. But more commonly, the system you're looking at here, where we're conveying to it. And the whole thing about a compactor is it's a pressure device. That's what, the, that's what it's all about. Certainly, it's dewatering and removing organics, but the, the design considerations, most important are it being a pressure device. You can see the, the, the order of magnitude of reduction in volume uh, in, in organics, uh, in weight, all of these just to reduce the transportation costs uh, to, for going to landfills because uh, the discharge does meet the uh, paint filter test requirement. Again, these are features. Our, our mission here is design considerations and application, not so much specific design features to, to our systems, but just want to share with you that because it is such a, uh, because the pressure considerations are so severe, uh, uh, you need to have thrust and radial bearings. You need to be able to adjust your drive system so the alignment of this cantilevered screw stays true over time. Uh, the bullet on the end helps is on this end of the compactor is driven into the compacted screenings to help it keep alignment. All of these things are important um, in when considering the selection of a, of a compactor. Uh, let alone features such as containment trays being able to be removed so you can have access to the, uh, in this case we call it profile bar. The one on the left is for a coarse screenings application. A more fine uh, spaced profile bar is for fine screens uh, application. Um, all of these features are important for the longevity of washer compactors. So that's, that's pretty much the story. Um, delta separation. We've got uh, the, the products I went through. We also provide the belt and screw conveyors to both up and downstream for these products. Uh, and uh, wanted to share with you that on our website, if you visit our website, there are numerous photographs. Uh, there are also learning center videos that we're uh, really um, jumping on and, and am getting, uh, we're getting a lot of really positive feedback that the learning center videos, um, how do you size a scum pipe is one of them. Uh, do you need an intermediate support for a scum pipe? Uh, learning videos are readily available for you guys. Anything beyond that, we appreciate you going to our reps um, out there around the country um, or come to us directly and we'll get you any information you need from there.